Hi, everybody. Welcome to our channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with our co-host, my co-host, Janice Gillum-Grady. Hi, Janice. How are you? I'm good. Hello, uh, Mark. And good day, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a little off today. Oh, yes? Yeah, something running, going on? I've just been running around crazy, just trying to get some things done. And my granddaughter's coming over, and I'm just... I've put blinds down on the doors, hoping that she'll leave me alone and not come and interfere. And then I'll get to see her later. Okay. <laughs> That's but great. Be, That's great. Be prepared. Be prepared. Elizabeth might sneak in that door. <laughs> That's cool. John Siskowski in the house. I want to mention, John, we got your little Keebler Davy elves. I got to give this to Jana. So thank you so much for that. These are cute. Janice, did you see these? I got one for you. Yeah, one for you me. sent you sent me the photo. Yeah, those, those and John's cute. in there. Also, just briefly, John, I got the hats. Okay, uh, you got to realize my head. I have a size eight and a quarter head. The hats that you sent, <laughs> they'll fit Janice, but they'll sit on like like a yamaka on the back of my head. That's how small <laughs> they are. <laughs> but we appreciate I get all the hats. <laughs> I get yeah, all the hats. Get the hats. Yeah, so you can go through them and, and wear them and everything. And uh, we also want to welcome Juliana Betancourt. She's in uh, the house and uh, she's a member of our channel. Anyway, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest that we're going to interview. And many of you have seen him already on uh, SPTV. He has his own channel. And it is Mitch Brisker. How you doing, Mitch? Great. Great to see you guys. Thanks yeah, for great inviting to see me on. I'm really looking forward to this. That's great. Yeah, so yeah, we're going to oh, go one. ahead. Yeah, yeah so no, Mitch, how are you liking how you liking doing the <laughs> sweet. Remember we got to go like this. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say how are you liking having your own channel and and uh, doing videos and everything? Oh, it's great. It's great. I mean, this is a, a, a fantastic community. As I was telling you before, uh, you you the three of us, although I'd met Janice a long time ago and I've never met you Mark in person, but our closeness as friends, our connection is deeper in the virtual world than it ever could have been in real life when we were in Scientology. So uh, and that's true for a lot of people that I've connected with. It's an incredible community. It's helped on a great many levels. The only bad thing I have to say about it is that it's interfered with me finishing my book because ah. it, it's so engaging, but I'm plugging away. So if I disappear, if I go offline for a little bit, it's just to take a break, but I'll put updates on the channel. Uh, and so here we are. Here we are. You know, I You're was doing thinking better about than me. <laughs> You're doing better than me, Mitch, because I haven't even touched my third book since I started this. Yeah, channel. but oh, okay, fine. Your third book. That doesn't make me better <laughs> yeah. than you. I, I haven't finished my first and you're you're complaining about YouTube interfering <laughs> with your third. Go, Janice. I was, go. I, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was thinking actually about it while I was driving today about a possible book idea for myself. And it's not going to be basically like a time frame, time, you know, form right. an event right. biography. But I was, I'm thinking about doing short stories about different short stories that uh, things that happened to me throughout my life in Scientology. That's a great idea. It, and each chapter would just be a short yeah, story. Do you know a, what I mean? I'm telling and you, Mark, it's it, a great idea. You yeah, just so I'm do thinking it. about you doing that. Don't yeah. even think about the, the timeline of it. Like, you got to yeah. get it in order. It can be all of out of order. I, I'm telling you, because I did a similar thing. I set out to say, you know what? This isn't a memoir. It's a series of essays, right? Yeah. And then as they went along, I'm like, no, this is more interesting if it's told first. So it starts to fall into chronological shape. But you should do it because it's just... You know, you just concentrate on that one moment in time and you have such great stories to tell. And if anybody thinks they've read one book by an ex scientologist they've read them all. Every, I've read them all. I, Janice, I've read your books. Um, I'm already imagining your book in my mind, Mark. And I'm telling you, every single one of them is full of surprises. And, uh, you know, there's a sameness to them all, but there's also this incredible... Uh, you know, variety because we recapture our our individuality and our identity after we leave Scientology and, and people, when they express it in a book, it's, it can be joyful. I'm just yeah. now reading Liz Gale's book, which I'm oh, really yeah. enjoying. And I'm going to do a, 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 I'll do a, a stream with her about the book because I really want to talk with her about it online. But Yeah, what I was thinking. 
Yeah, I was thinking about it today that I was thinking about it today that basically it's easier to confront if you just write one story rather than going sure. like this huge book. And then you write another story and then another story and right. another story. Right. Because I have I have stories not just from when I was in Scientology. I have stories since I left Scientology that I people may find interesting. I mean, for the longest time I thought, well, I'm telling my stories on the, the channel. But then I thought, you know, I could actually write some things that I wouldn't necessarily, you know, put on the channel. And I think uh, that people, maybe they'll find them interesting. We'll see. Well, also, Mark, you can tell a story on your channel and then you can write the same story. And people yeah. who've seen it on the channel, when they read it, they'll say, oh, this is good. I know about this because there's always going to be additional insight. And, and, you know, words are written words are like architecture. It, it's different seeing the building than just hearing about the building. So yeah. it's, and I'm sure, I'll bet you have interesting stories from just before when you were a teenager, when you got into oh, yeah. psychology. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I can't I, listen. Let me say. Uh, officially here on YouTube. I can't wait for your book, Mark. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. oh, I better get cracking. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to, you know, Janice and I are going to have to, you know, put in that 25th hour a day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, you're ex or you'll find it. You know, that's right. Yeah, yeah. If that's anybody right. knows how to find an extra hour in the day, it's a Sea Orc member. Yeah, uh, exactly. Okay, great. Well, we'll go ahead and get started with your story. We're, we're going to talk about how, Mitch, you got involved in Scientology, I guess, was it in the 1970s, early? It was, um, yeah. It was. Yeah. I, I mean, I got into Scientology in 1973. Prior to that, I never heard of it. Literally, I'd never heard of Scientology or Dianetics. I didn't know anybody that was involved in it. I grew up in a place in West Hollywood, kind of a kind of a well-known place. There had been books written about it, uh, a place called Laurel Canyon, which was, there was there's a very, a very wonderful book called Laurel Canyon, uh, the America's something most, I don't know, notorious uh, rock and roll neighborhood. It, it was it was the place out of which the music scene in Southern California, you know, the Birds and Crosby, Sills and Nash and the Doors and all these people, it's where they all sprung out of and a ton of other stuff. And so I was fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to have grown up there, come of age there. Uh, it was also the center of all of our experimentation with drugs, and which also included heroin, uh, which kind of had to do with the Vietnam War because there was a lot of heroin being brought in from Vietnam. And it was also a good way to get out of the draft <laughs> was to <laughs> do a lot of heroin, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was a I was a drug draft dodger, but anyway, I, I unfortunately I ended up with uh, addicted to heroin when I was, you know, just out of high school, and I had I I, had, I was in I was studying at uh, a California Institute of the Arts, which is a noted art professional art school. I was in the film department, mm -hmm. and but I, I had dropped out because I was really struggling with this addiction thing. You know, I was in and out of it. And so I went to a rehab uh, in, somewhere in, in the San Fernando Valley. I, I just went to, I, you know, I had to get myself together for, to try to get back into school. I had dropped out and I couldn't stay out for too long or I would have to reapply, which would be a difficult situation. Uh, and so I, I, while I was in this rehab, I was, um, I was, I don't know how to say this where it doesn't sound silly, but I was cast by a production company or I was called into a production company. They were looking for young, you know, maybe let's say camera ready kids. There was a director by the name of Floyd Mutrix and uh, there he is, there's Floyd. And uh, he'd done a couple of other films. Uh, he was a writer, mostly a writer and a sort of a producer. And most of his credits are, you know, he did some stories for, noted films like Dick Tracy and uh, Mulholland Falls and some other things. And uh, so Floyd was, he had, he had this idea to do this film called Dusty and Sweets McGee. And, you know, it's, I just have to say, I, I, I hadn't spoken about this for a long, long time because it was sort of in the past and it was something I was just done with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Scientology doesn't like you. In Scientology, you're, I just have to say before we go on, you're forbidden from talking about what they call your case. Now, I don't know if your viewers know what your case is, but I think you could probably explain that pretty well, Mark. 
With well, basically, your case is all of your bad experiences in your reactive mind uh, that you attack in Dianetics to get rid of and, you know, become clear. And then uh, then it's also your your different experiences on what we called your time track, which is basically you live for billions of years and something may have happened to you past life or whatever. And that's all included when you do your processing and you get auditing. Oh, yeah. that, that's that's what yeah. you're addressing to, yeah. to, so that doesn't have any yeah. emotional effect over you. Yeah, that's your case. And that is the thing you are addressing in Dianetics and Scientology. And you are forbidden as a person receiving services to discuss your case with anyone other than an auditor who will then also discuss it with other people like the case supervisor and God knows who else over the dinner table. <laughs> but <laughs> even though they say it's it confidential. It wasn't supposed to be that way, but it did yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, all of this stuff that I'm telling you, well, that was in Scientology, this would come under the rubric of your case. So you never talked about it. You didn't talk about it. Right. Uh, and so it, it's actually one of the ways in which Scientology keeps people isolated and separated because talking about it, like I'm doing with you here, guys, now, it helps other people to heal. It helps you to heal. It helps to form connections. And Scientology can't tolerate any of that stuff. So they're like, you are not allowed to talk to anybody about your case. And I didn't realize that until very recently what a destructive thing that is. So let me get back to talking about my case, shall we? Okay. So, <laughs> so anyway, anyway, so I was essentially, you know, 20... Two-year-old, broken, drug-addicted, film school dropout who'd never heard of Scientology. And I had a girlfriend who uh, I was very, very attached to. And she was simultaneously also getting up drugs. We kind of became sort of addicted together. So I get this call. The, the, the guy who ran the rehab, he gets this call one day from a production company in Studio City. And they're looking for kids. They're trying to cast young people to do a sort of a... We have a term in film, cinema verite. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a French term. It just means truth in film. And it's a mm -hmm. kind it's a kind of was a movement, a sort of a quasi-documentary movement where right. it was yeah, you got people are probably familiar with cinema verite. So Floyd was trying to do the cinema verite uh drug-soaked version of American graffiti. It, it was kind of like Panic in Needle Park versus meets uh, you know, meets um uh, American Graffiti with a lot of really groovy rock and roll thrown in. Well, I guess that would be okay. American Graffiti. Uh, so we met, so I grabbed uh, my, my girlfriend because they said, hey, they're looking for a, a, a couple, a young couple. So I grabbed her. They drove us out to the production office and we were just like cast immediately in the lead roles. I mean, it wasn't even a question. We walked in, they talked to us and said, yeah, you're going to be Dusty and Sweet Smiggy. It was an ensemble piece, meaning our part was not any better than any others and i mean is this it here is this it yeah here? that's it there's me if you look in the bottom row i would be um second from the left oh yeah yeah in, in the black shirt with the really 70s mustache um yeah so back when i had hair that's the cover of the dvd i guess from a later issue that was my girlfriend who tragically overdosed a few months after the film was oh, released no. And uh, yeah, that's me, believe it or not. That's me. I was 22 years old. <laughs> that's, that was a, a production still. Um, my kids were pretty shocked when they found these pictures on the internet. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you look like you're a member of the Eagles. <laughs> Something. I mean, no, I think the Eagles saw this picture and then they decided to look like me because I don't think the Eagles were around when this picture was done. No, so really. anyway. That's how you looked without the mustache when I first met you. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have that mustache very long. I don't know why I had it. Honestly, it was, yeah, I, I did not. I had it for a couple, for just this period of maybe a couple of years. And then, you know, Where, over the. What year, what year was this about? Do you know? Yeah, 1972. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so <laughs> I should probably sell autograph copies to that. Anyway, <laughs> hey. Uh, so anyway, that was that. So then I was, I, it, we got cast to do the film. We were in the uh -huh. film with a number of other people. 
a couple of them were actual, there were actors like Billy Gray, who had come from Father's Knows Best, who played uh, like a drug dealer. And uh, there was a young couple who were also actors. And then everybody else, we were just kind of, you know, one guy was an ex-con, great guy. And hey, Mitch, they, Mitch, Mark Hadley's in the house and he says, holy moly, oh, in your photograph. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot you don't know about me, Mark. But, uh, and I'm sure that's that goes two ways. <laughs> there it is again for anybody who may have missed it. Yeah, that's the holy moly shot. I, I, we need to turn that into a meme that just says holy moly. <laughs> it's just, yep, it's that, way, okay. that was me in yeah. my actor days. Well, I mean, there—I don't know who took the photo, but we had a professional photographer on the set. I mean, the film was photographed by William Fraker, who was considered. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah, greatest well, cinematographer. Renowned, yeah, cinematographer. Yeah, I mean, he was—he's considered the greatest cinematographer who ever lived who did not win an Oscar. Um, he's no longer with us. Uh, Billy was a great guy. I was really lucky to work with him. Yeah, I mean, this—the guy who did the sound, William Randall, had won an Oscar for *In Cold Blood*. So it was—it was a very legitimate film. Uh, it was. Uh, legitimate but it was kind of very very underground i mean i do not know where they got the money to make it there was a very low budget they didn't pay us very much and i remember it was the first time that i ever was taken to lunch or, or at all uh, there's a restaurant a very famous restaurant on hollywood boulevard called musso and frank's <laughs> oh yeah yeah and uh, they've been around since 1917 a uh, very storied restaurant i could i could do a whole hour on stories about musso and frank's but I, the first time I ever ate there was with Floyd and the crew. And then, you know, later I found out that the production manager had paid for our meal with like a forged credit card. Like they were doing all kinds of things to save money, like take us to one of the most expensive restaurants in Hollywood and then pay it with a fake credit card. You know, I think blown for good. Mark Headley would say, Hey, that's the gold way. That's how they did it. Yeah. Gold. So this is where yeah. I, hey, I got, we need gas. We need gas to go yeah. to the shoot. Well, we'll dig around and see what we can find in the couch. Yeah. So it was a little like um, a sea work shoot, except we didn't get in trouble for, uh, you know, doing drugs or having sex with each other. But yeah. um, <laughs> fortunately, but anyway, so yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience because I was, think about this. I'm in, I'm a, uh, films, I uh, dropped out of film school, like one of the most expensive colleges in America. And I've dropped out of that. I'm addicted to heroin. And then I get cast to play an actor, to pay a part in a film as a heroin addict, right? So it's, it's weird. Like, what am I here? Am I a filmmaker? Am I a junkie? Like, what is it? So as a film student, it was a great experience. As a person recovering from drugs, it was the worst possible place to be. Uh, and, you know, then to, to try to maintain the authenticity, the cinema verite authenticity, the makers of the film made up a lot of stories. Like, you know, they made up this, they, they used our real names, Beverly and Mitch, and tried to say that that was really us and they were just following us around with a camera, which is, we were completely under their direction, right? We, we did a lot of ad lib scenes based on a framework, but... It, they presented it as though they were somehow following us like as a documentary. And, you know, and then at the credits at the end, it was like, you know, uh, you know, we, it was like, we got divorced. I moved to Oregon. It was just, they made all this shit up. And I was pretty disappointed about that. I mean, e even though I remained friends with Floyd for years and the film, it was the top grossing film for two weeks in the summer of 72. Wow. Uh, and I had gotten a small, job as a production assistant on a film that Peter Fonda was directing, a little independent film. And I had to come and I, I wasn't in town when Dusty and Sweet McGee opened. And then I had to come to LA as a production assistant to pick up some paperwork or whatever and fly back to Idaho where we were on location. And I lived in West Hollywood and I was driving down the Sunset Strip and there was this billboard, like this massive billboard with she and I and the title of the film. And I was like, you know, I'd grown up, you know, hanging out on the Sunset Strip. I mean, I used to sneak into the whiskey and see the doors when I was 15. I snuck into Ciro's and I saw the birds play with Bob Dylan. So wow. this was, I'm sitting here staring at this billboard. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Anyway, so uh, tragically, she, uh, my girlfriend uh, died of an overdose on December 17th, 1972. The film opened up in July. That's and I'll, I'll, yeah, that's her there. And I'll tell you by, um, I think by the end of that year, I mean, 
I think that two of the, her and another of the people in the film had died of overdoses before this. So, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a, of a, of a strange connection, but so I, I was having dinner with Floyd one night and he had a, he was with this girl who's his girlfriend and she had just recently introduced her, him to celebrity center and unbeknownst to me, because he wasn't a Scientologist when we were working together, he'd gotten into Scientology and he was, uh, you know, somewhat of a celebrity at, at Celebrity Center. He was close with Yvonne, with your mom. Th they knew one another very well. And he was a bit of a fixture. I mean, he and Milton Caselitz, they were like the two actor dudes. But, you know, Floyd didn't teach acting. But he was associated with a number of noted films, uh, he made some other films that were really popular. He did a film called Aloha, Bobby and Rose that he directed. Let, let me show those. Okay. I'm just going to. Yeah, go them. ahead. I got them here in a second here. Here we go. Yeah. I mean, if you're wondering about his career, uh, he this is actually a really interesting film. He was sort of in this, you know, uh, you know, Jean-Luc Godard kind of Truffaut-ish sort of French new wave, but with a kind of very L.A. twist. And you know, I think Mitch, I'm going to comment here that they don't make films like they did in the 70s anymore. I mean, the 70s is like a real uh, golden age, really. Yeah. Cinema, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And and we saw the emergence of, you know, people in the 70s. We saw the emergence of Martin Scorsese. Yeah. A new generation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a book. It's called Raging Bulls. And oh, I can't remember the name of it. There's a wonderful, wonderful book about the emergence of that generation of filmmakers I, uh, i've read it i know which book you're talking yeah, about what's yeah. it called it's raging great. bulls and something else it's and something else yeah i yeah. can't remember either but it was great yeah. yeah yeah and it's really bugging me now i can't go on no but anyway yeah it was a really amazing time uh, and i met a lot of other people having nothing to do with floyd but a lot of people in that circle uh it was it was probably the most formative time in american cinema I mean, you had, you know, The Godfather and, you know, some amazing, amazing work that came out of that, that period. Yeah. And that was also the emergence of the first generation of film school directors, of directors who'd actually studied filmmaking in college. Uh, uh, the first one being John Milius. He was, people don't really realize oh, yeah. that we're kind of off into the weeds now, but John Milius was the first uh, film school graduate who actually made a film. I, I'm not sure what it was. It might have been Big Wednesday, which yeah. I, I recommend. And remember, Lee Purcell co-starred in that. Remember, she was a Scientologist. Yeah. yeah, she was actually really good in it. She was like the emotional center of the film. I had I'd seen it not uh, some Here's years the title. ago. Denver Stevo has the title. Easy Riders. Yeah, Easy Riders, Rage and Bulls. Bulls. Yeah. The yeah. Rock and Roll Generation Saved Hollywood. Yeah, there you go. I highly recommend it. And Dustin Switz McGee and Floyd Mutrius's work was kind of in that that school. I mean, and I'd also worked for Peter Fonda. I don't want to get into all that, but when I was in college as a production assistant, real lowest person on the totem pole, I worked with him and I worked with, uh, what's his name? Um, Lazo Kovacs, not Lazo Kovacs. Uh, one of the, there was a second unit cinematographer who worked on Dusty Sus McGee, who had shot Easy Rider. And I later did work with Lazo Kovacs, who shot a lot of those films when I was in commercials. So I was kind of lucky to, to, to be a bit, you know, an eyewitness and somewhat involved and meet some terrific characters. So back to the story, yeah. back to mm -hmm. the story, I was pretty wrecked uh, after sh the death of my girlfriend. And Floyd thought uh, Celebrity Center could possibly help me. So he brought me in there and he introduced me to the folks. Uh, my dog needs. Can you give me a second? I gotta let my dog out. Yeah, sure. No problem. Hey, Denver Stevo, thanks for that, uh, on, that shout that. out on the uh, book title. We appreciate it. We want to also thank all the other Goldies in here in the chat. Thanks, Goldie, and thanks our other members and all you subscribers that are watching. Uh, and here comes Mitch back again. That's why they call it live. He just gave me that look <laughs> like if you don't open the door, I'm gonna poop on your foot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so then there it is. Uh, I'll never forget that place. And uh, yeah, down yeah, on 8th Street. Yeah, 8th and Alvarado, which is a real interesting part of town. Uh, yeah, so that parking lot, I remember there used to be like a, what we called a roach coach. You know, today they call it a food truck. But yeah. <laughs> used to park in there. Remember, Janice, every day the 
the food truck would come in there on breaks. Yes. I, I guess the guy that ran the food truck, like he had the, the course breaks scheduled time. So he knew when all the students were going to come out and need to have coffee and whatever else. So yeah, that was it. I, I was a rec and I went on a uh, course there and then I actually didn't, I signed up for a course and never came back. And then, um, about a week later, the what is called the MLO, the, the medical liaison officer, who's the person that coordinates medical care for the staff because they don't have access to medical care of CERG members without going through this office, right? And so she tracked me down. I, I'd actually uh, uh, checked myself into a hospital because I was so desperate to get off drugs. And she like busted me out of the hospital and it sounds like a kidnapping, but it wasn't because I didn't want to stay there. <laughs> so anyway, and then she said, you're going to come live with us. This was the amazing part. I don't know. If, I think I told you guys this. She uh -huh. said, you're going to come live with us. She'd arranged just a small, you know, I, my father was paying them $250 a week and maybe a hundred bucks for courses. It was nothing. You know, today you will give one an organ. You're like, oh, I have a drug problem. They're like, that'll be $30,000, please. Well, you can go to Narconon but you're going to need to get the hell out of here because we don't want you puking on our carpet, right? So, or whatever. Uh, but I, I just kind of lucked into this very special bubble that was really existed as a result of your mom, Janice. I mean, you know that we've talked about it. Uh, Yvonne is just here. She is right here. Yeah. She's this just a, Janice's mother. Yeah. A beloved character in Scientology by so many people and through the, her own, her, her idealism and the goodness of her heart, it, it was, it neutralized all of the negative stuff in Scientology and all that came through was the I idealistic veneer of Scientology. So for this very short period of time, this woman helped a bunch of artists. I mean, she's the reason why you have celebrities and you have artists in Scientology. And of course, you know, she never intended it to, the, the narrative you know, I mean, as Janice, as you know, I mean, your, your mom's outcome was not good. No, uh, be, no yeah, it wasn't. Because so, eventually what happened with her, she, uh, Hubbard took her off of there. I don't remember what job. He he took her out of Celebrity Center. He was too successful. He couldn't have that. Yeah. The Guardian's office had sent out false reports on her, which resulted in Hubbard ordering the evaluator to get her replaced and then he set up, um, had her set up the PR org with no financial backup or anything. And so she, that was a big loss to her because she'd built CC up to like over 200 staff at the time. Yeah, from nothing, yeah. from literally yeah, like from nothing. nothing. And now yeah, it was an ideal that org. Can't... That was an ideal org. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even though oh, it looked, yeah, it it really looked like shit, like the carpet, that place, yeah. it looked like it was. Like somebody went to the 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 and and, and went to a, a carpet store and got the the remnants out of the dumpster. They and, did. Uh, yeah, it's what it looked like. And the people had gone to like flea markets and thrift shops and bought things and decorated the place. It was awesome. Yeah. It was like but, this great hippie pad. But she did upgrade it when they moved over to La Brea. That oh was yeah, that absolutely. No, the intention. Building. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but so, you know that she, that was what. She, go ahead. She found the manor for Celebrity Center, and it was taken from her and made into something wow. else. Yeah, but she she and worked at the mission that found it. And also, well, just so everybody knows, that was what Hubbard wanted. He said, that "You don't have to have nice premises; just keep them clean and deliver, yeah. deliver, right. deliver, deliver." Mm -hmm. And that, and you know, Miscavige then took it to the nth degree, where have they have to be Taj Mahals yeah. before you can have anybody in there to get services. You know, yeah, because back in those days, when your mom was running the show, Janice, you couldn't find a place to sit in a course room at night, and yeah. at, at whatever it was, nine o'clock or nine thirty or whatever. Uh, when the course was over, people didn't go home. They stayed. They wanted to and, hang out, right? Yeah, and there was <laughs> poetry readings. There was acting. There was improv. There were musical performances. Uh, there were people. It was amazing. It was like, so for me, I was like, wow, I found a community. I found some structure. Um, you know, truth be told, like two things. One, we're not talking about some, some lost, uh, uh, unfulfilled promise of Scientology that somehow it could go through some reformation and things could be like that. That's never going to happen. 
this was a total fluke. It was a bubble. It was based on this one woman's idealism and her love and care of artists. And that was that. And even then, they just crushed her spirit and eventually uh, put her in such a position that I'm sure that it led to her passing. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm like nostalgic for this period and can we all like get together and make it happen again? Because that Here's ain't happening. For you. Yeah. Here's a question for you. Uh, Mitch, do you remember the event she hosted with the painted seagulls dress? No. Um, remember, I was not, as we say in Scientology, in present time. Because <laughs> I was... <laughs> I, I, I was, have a photo. Yeah. I have a photo of her in that dress. Oh, oh, okay. We, yeah, maybe I'll remember. I mean, I had people come up to me for years and say, Oh, I remember you. You'd fall out of your chair doing drills and pass out in a puddle of sweat because I, w I was like withdrawing from heroin. And I was on the course with, on the classroom with everybody else. But I'm telling you, I, the other thing I wanted to say, other than the fact that there's no going back to some some Scientology reformation where that's ever going to happen again. Uh, the other thing is that I misidentified the success I had getting off drugs as if it had something to do with Scientology. It had to do with Yvonne's love and caring and how that reflected in the, was carried on the step. And it had to do with the fact that I was ready to do it. I needed something positive to disrupt the cycle that I was involved in uh, long enough so I could regain some power and that's where it happened. But there's nothing in Scientology technology that can do that. There's no, nothing. I mean, nar the, if somebody's successful or Narconon, it's because they just got them to stop using drugs long enough where they can get their shit together because anybody that wants to can do it. And I've never really spoken out as a survivor of addiction. And I realized that Scientology prevented me from doing that and that it's important. So if anybody listening to this has anything going on that is wrecking their lives and they can't stop doing there is so much hope for you out there and anyway so it's just something i have to say good okay yeah and then there's this is the house that they brought you to right yeah yeah that that was the staff house oh my god it was like a hippie pad and you know somebody told me oh charlie <laughs> chaplin used to live here which was just complete bullshit he never yeah. even lived in the neighborhood but which i found <laughs> out later but Where was yeah, this at? This was on, um, what's the name of the street? Do you remember, Janet? Lake Street. Lake Street. Lake Street, yeah. So this was about yeah. this was about four blocks from Celebrity Center, I think. About, about It was about a 10-minute walk. I mm -hmm. know because I, I did it twice a day for six weeks. It's a big house. It's a bi And every space in that house that had a door you could close was turned into a bedroom with, uh, you know, like a dorm except for the living room, obviously the kitchen. I think there was another room off the living room. But other than those common spaces, uh, everything was sleeping quarters. And then it had this massive basement, which was the dining room. Yep. And uh, even the attic, up where you see that little dormer window up on the top, even mm -hmm. the attic up there, that was... Um, well, the, that, this person's asking, my sister lived with the MAA at CC in the attic. Was it that first building? <laughs> yeah, your sister. Probably well, so, because then it was the Wilcox after that, right, Janice? Yeah, after the Lake Street, they got the Wilcox. <laughs> yeah. So I'm assuming that they were a male-female couple, right? But when, you, <laughs> when you say lived at, lived with, oh, was the, uh, the MAA, uh, I guess, was a woman because – they didn't kind of let couples, they didn't let people sleep. They were much more lenient about the whole 2D stuff, obviously, and they let people have kids and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I'm sure if unmarried couples hooked up, they didn't get, you know, they didn't get sent to the RPF. I, I don't know, I, I, but I never heard of anything like that. But if it happened, I probably wouldn't have been aware of it anyway. But my roommates, you guys will get a kick out of that. I had a shared a room with two other guys. One was Charlie Wash, who I would oh. La later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was one of the gold musicians, and then I would later yeah. get, to, get to know him at gold. And the other was Wings Hauser, who back then was Wings Living Right. So uh -huh. those were the two. And I know you did a show about his son. Yeah, uh, Cole Hauser, the guy, the actor on uh, Yellowstone. And then, uh, and then it's funny because then Cass Warner, who who got married to Wings, Janice, she helped uh, your mother buy the Wilcox building, right, in Hollywood? That yeah, she became did. the uh, the place for staff to live in after the lake house. Yeah. 
Right, right. Yeah, I never know what happened to Wings. We we were, you know, roomies, so we knew each other pretty well around the Oregon stuff. But then I remember when he left, and like I didn't, I knew Cass later, but I didn't know them. During. He was married to someone else, I think, back back then, or not married. I don't know. He was a great guy, incredibly talented. He was not an yeah. actor then. He was a, a singer songwriter, and he was mm -hmm. very talented. He's since become a big international star. Yeah, no, he has tons of, he's like a Rutger Hauer kind of guy. He's got a, yeah, he does a lot of uh, hard-boiled action films. He's been doing that for years. Yeah, he's, yeah, uh, yeah he's like, uh, yeah, international star means that, you know, there's a lot of company countries that will hire you that won't necessarily yeah. hire you in America. But uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of films with wings that, uh or yeah. out of sync, or out of sync because they're badly dubbed in foreign languages. But yeah, he's a great guy, and he's done really well, and his kid has done spectacularly well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then this is the front steps, right, for, of the lake house. This is yeah this place that you guys used to hang out. Yeah, I stumbled up those steps one night. I was not doing well, and your mom came and got me, and took me up to bed. She said, "Come here, dearie. Come on, dearie. We'll get you to sleep." I was really not doing well. And she, she was just amazing. I mean, who, what executive does that? You know, and the way she, and she, your mom was petite. She was not a big woman, and and you know, I was like at least a head taller than her. She put her arm around me and guided me up the stairs like I was weightless. Like I'm sorry, but this <laughs> this woman had like magical powers. And I've always considered like if I look at my my the path of my life, I say, well, okay, yeah, Yvonne, it, she kind of saved my life. So I'm. It's one of the things that trapped me in a Scientology, not her fault, but it was just mm -hmm. like, wow, you know, you yeah. really, you, it's very attractive. And so anyway, that's the deal. But there wouldn't be all the, I mean, sh she was responsible for, I, really for getting John Travolta in. And, and I mean, John was, I remember he was on course, he was studying Scientology at the La Brea Celebrity Center. Right. And uh, he was just one of the students. I mean, it was like, yeah, he's on a TV show. He's on Welcome Back Hotter. He's, you know, he's like a celebrity for that, but he was just on course with everybody. You know, yeah. it, was, it was a much more casual scene back yeah. then. You know, today it's like, there's if there's a celebrity in the org, like, you're not allowed to look at them. So. Yeah, no, I remember yeah, in 1970, I remember 1978 being at the La Brea location doing, I was doing, you know, expediting or whatever, just right. doing, you know, admin. And I was sitting in the lobby of that La Brea building and John Travolta parks right across the street in his convertible Mercedes, walks right in. This is right after, you know, after Saturday Night Fever and Grease and all that. Hi, how you doing? No problem. And then yeah. I was there one time he brought Priscilla Presley in for the first time. Wow. I was sitting in the lobby yeah. when he brought her in around then. And uh, that was amazing. You know, like yeah, you said, uh, nobody, nobody bothered them. Nothing. No, you know? because your mom, Janice, created such a safe space that when people yeah. went in there, it's like, you weren't going to bug them. You weren't going to, nobody's going to ask you for your autograph. They're not going to feel intimidated either because it was such a safe space. So oh, anyway, yeah. I, that, I remember, yeah. I remember showing up myself and there'd be these different slabs, even Mickey McNeil when he was uh, oh, the Mickey. Drummer, the three hey, he still owes me money. No, <laughs> <laughs> I loved him, Mickey McNeil. Yeah, I remember when Mickey, Mickey came in on 8th Street yeah yeah you knew me. yeah he was he was the drummer for three dog night yeah uh, and then michael lembeck yeah. too was wasn't he michael lembeck yeah, and michael i didn't lembeck. really yeah, yeah i didn't really know him larry mcneely yeah. who was you know had been the featured soloist on the glenn campbell good time hour as a banjo player mm -hmm. he's yeah. considered one of the greatest banjo players that ever lived it was my music instructor for about five years we were very close friends he was one of my close and david campbell and there was a bunch of people back then that yeah, that were Robbie and Jeff Levin. Yeah, Robbie and Jeff. Yes. Levin. Ro Jeff was my one of. I didn't never knew Robbie because they were. I came in in seventy three, early seventy three, right. And, and um, Jeff had been in and out of the Sea Org and was now at CC, kind of a fixture. And he was one of the first people that I met. Uh, uh, he when he was playing, he was playing with Larry McTeele, but he was, for me, most notably, he was playing with Jimmy Spheros. Who was? Oh yeah. Unfortunately, Jimmy died in a in a motorcycle accident. But yeah, he he was a major uh, 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 person, uh, uh, fixture at Celebrity Center. And I think he he, did, he cut three albums. I think on CBS Records. Uh, I I was 
my girlfriend at that time was the a and person at Epic Records that administered uh, Jimmy's label, uh, his, his record contract. So I got to see him a lot. It's how I met Jeff because Jeff was playing with Jimmy. And then we be friends ever since. I mean, he eventually Jeff did the theme for me for the Dianetics ad. So that was yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then of course Chick Corea and Return to Forever, Stanley Clark. I mean, all these people, the Incredible String Band, Mike Karen from the Incredible String Band. I mean, you know, some of the younger we're 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 senior citizens here, right? But these were big acts in the late in the early seventies. We are we are over. Well, they're still you know some of them are towering legends like Chick. Yeah, yeah, like Chick. Chick and stuff yeah absolutely doesn't matter what uh what age you are so yeah well yeah. Show this picture here let's see this yeah no, so this i thought we agreed i was going to pay you not to show that picture <laughs> but but okay yeah so this it's was the ponytail <laughs> yeah this is when i had a ponytail um which fortunately uh, someone talked me and it just you know i didn't want to be the guy with a ponytail and a comb over so yeah Long before everybody else, I've just like shaved the whole goddamn thing off. But yeah, this was, and I, you know, I wouldn't consider my, I was not a celebrity outside of Scientology. So I was a celebrity in Scientology mm -hmm. uh, because at this point, when this photo was, when I did this issue, I was working at Gold. I was the, directing all the tech films and uh -huh. I had been CC public. So this was why, because it was like, oh, one of our public is directing all the tech films, right? And so it was very funny because the woman who was going to do the interview sent me the interview questions and I just tore them up because I knew that they were not the questions that David Miscavige would want her to ask me, right? And I, I wasn't looking for notoriety because I could care less at, uh, about that work in, in Scientology or whatever. In terms of furthering my career, I could care less but I knew that the only way to be interviewed in this magazine was to promote Scientology and to say how lucky I was as an artist that I was able to, to uh, be paid to do my art and to help Scientology at the same time. So I, I structured the interview around that. It was, you know, so it was, really, it was just a complete promo piece. And of course, everybody loved it because I was like, you know, I was being such a good soldier, but I did it on purpose. It was just like... I, secretly, I was also trying to help them recruit other pros because I was the yeah. only one up there and I was finding it so hard to leave. And that's another story we should talk about uh, that I thought if I could just get more and more pros to come up there, I could maybe get lost in the crowd, you yeah. know, so and disappear because I it was not my intention to stay there for, you know, How, after you, after you, you quit drugs. You know, while you were, when you were there at CC or whatever, in early right, 70s, right, right, yeah, yeah. And Six then weeks how, later, how did, how did your path go from there? What happened? After well, that? so like you know, I was an emaciated six foot tall, one hundred twenty six pounds. When I got wow. there, six six weeks later, I couldn't put my jeans on. <laughs> my jeans didn't fit. I was sleeping like a baby. You know, I thought it was all because I told you it wasn't. It was that I found this community of wonderful people. And they were like, no, you're not going to do drugs. And then the rest of it was my own. Well, that's really all it was. But so then I went back to school I, and I went back to CalArts and I completed and got my degree. And I got a, I was very lucky to get a, a job with a, a fledgling production company called Robert Abel and Associates, which really blew up an internationally renowned company. And we didn't really talk about that in our pre-show stuff, but mm -hmm. um you know, so I got a chance to work on a lot of international commercials. I got a chance to do a lot of traveling. Uh, I left that job, but went on my own. And then that's when our friend uh, who was in marketing um, contacted me about working with Jeff Hawkins and doing some ads. So that's pretty much the path. I mean, I was tracked in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've jumped from the seventies to 1990, but that's, I was just working doing commercials either for a production company or on my own. And what about your relationship with Floyd Matrix? Is this Floyd Matrix? Uh, yeah, again? Mutrix, Mutrix. Mutrix, uh, sorry, Mutrix, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. I, I mean, it kind of petered out. I used to see him occasionally. Uh, I don't know what happened to Floyd. I seriously doubt he, I, I've never heard of him in Scientology for years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I'm sure he's out there hustling. I mean, Floyd mostly... He mostly made a buck selling stories and screenplays and spec screenplays. He only directed a few films, 
And uh -huh. I mean, Dusty Sweets McGee was accepted into the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, and it is considered uh, critically <coughs> to be your dog sounds almost as psychotic as my dog. <laughs> so, because my when my dog barks, man, uh, I think it would explode. Beagles are loud. Okay, so yeah, I mean, he wrote a bunch of stories. Like he provided stories for Dick Tracy. What else? Um, a, a film I really like called Freebie and the Bean with. Uh, uh, oh yeah, James, that's with Alan Arkin. Uh, yeah, Free Alan Arkin and James Caan as a buddy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that that was his story. So. He, Floyd always seemed to have an office at one of the major studios where he was developing something and getting paid and then it would never get made and he'd go to another office. He was a very talented guy, but that's sort of mostly what his career was. I don't know what happened. He's out there doing tussling. Maybe he's retired. I don't know. Yeah, I heard he was, I heard he was still in. I met him. Really? Maybe. No, I, yeah. I, that's not possible. Or maybe he's, he's that guy, that off guy, the he fell off the wagon so many times. I mean, <laughs> oh. I mean, fell off the wagon, you know, which yeah. means going back to doing something you're not supposed to do. I remember one night, um, you know, there's a, there's a, the HCO, there's an ethics policy that the Sea Org members have to adhere to that if you're not supposed to really be getting gifts from the public, right? Right. And if you do get a gift, uh, then you're supposed to report it to HCO because they don't want public intelligence currying favor with the staff. They don't want the staff to be beholden to them. Things were a little looser back then at Celebrity Center. And I remember Floyd, he got in some ethics trouble. And Floyd, if you're listening, you're welcome for the story. For the, you're welcome for the free publicity because none of us have heard about you in years. Um, he got in a bunch of trouble and he, you know, and so... The day of his, he was kind of just came out of his handling, and all of a sudden, Chinese takeout food for everybody in the org <laughs> showed up. Like, we're talking like a hundred people, right? And that was like, I think that was how Floyd Mutrix uh, handled his ethics condition was like, well, I'll just get Chinese uh, that was, takeout. That was, his, that was his making amends. Yeah, that was his making yeah. amends. It was just really. But and people were freaking out because you know you're not you know public are not supposed to be feeding Sea Org members right, yeah. and but they there's nothing they could do about it for two reasons one thing it was already there and it smelled so good so yeah so we all ate it anyway it's a funny story about Floyd but I hope he's doing well because he's uh, yeah he was a good somebody friend. posted vegan three says that he's 82 years old yeah yeah right he's, 82 yeah he's yeah. yeah he's 82 but you know the guy. He was incredibly sharp and incredibly um, uh, talented. I mean, the guy was just always bubbling over the ideas. I met a lot of people, well-known people in film and some writers and so forth, and I never met anybody who had such a great grip on dialogue, on really being able to write a character that was different from any other character and come up with, with ways of ex having a character express their inner world that just was like an authentic human experience. I mean, he really impressed me. He told me, he used to go down to the farmer's market in LA. They had like a, they had like a common uh, covered, but semi outdoor dining place. You know, that you could go to the farmer's market and you could buy food for right. It was like a food court. And then it was very busy. You'd go sit in this area and you eat. And he would go down there and write with a pad and a paper. And because there were all these voices in his ear, like he was just being bombarded with different people's dialogue and stuff. And I took that lesson from him <laughs> whenever I get stuck writing. I would find some way to just listen to people speaking, just any human experience. And it's like, so I, I've always had admired Floyd, even though, I, you know, we have a bit of a, a very, we had a very strange relationship. That's great. So, yeah, that's, that's that story. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, How's it going now in terms of what you're doing? Are you you're doing uh, your book and your channel? And yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, there's a strike going on. You know, mm -hmm. I have constant contact and it's trying to get work and whatever. But I mean, you know, I'm kind of maybe aged out. I don't like to think about that, but so it's not going great. I mean, I, I, you know, I got to the point in Scientology where it's like, would you rather be homeless or would you rather be dead? And I'm like, you know, I'd rather be homeless. I mean, <laughs> would you rather be in Scientology? Or would you rather be homeless? I'm like, I would right. rather be homeless. 
you know, <laughs> uh, uh, at least you're you're able to experience your own identity. But you know, the story about how I got hired for the I don't know if we have, yeah we got time right we're good yeah 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 we, yeah, got time. we have time yeah this I mean this you know I consider that I had sort of two origin stories one was the story of getting into Scientology. And the other one was the story of going to work for them, which is it just is equally as bizarre. Um, it didn't have any. It doesn't have a, what do you call it? A body count like my earlier life had a body count, but at least not physical bodies. But uh, yeah, so when I was contacted, like we've all seen those films, right? The the technical trading films, right? I mean, yeah, Mark, you were involved. With helping the the, the the filming division to actually, yeah, you you helped to compile their their study materials and mm -hmm. you were right on the lines with all that. But they had an incredible difficulty successfully fulfilling Hubbard's edict to make these training films. And he had said back in St. Hill, I've said this before, he did this that the the film lecture lecture uh, an afternoon at St. Hill where he said on camera that. If we don't have film, Scientology is not going to make it. I right. mean, he, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I don't know if I can remember the quote, but it was that Scientology will only go so far as it's correctly taught, and it can only be taught if you can see how it's done, and it can only see how it's done if there's films. So starting in 1963, he was just adamant about this, you know, got to have films, because at that point, he was the main person teaching Scientology, right? Right. Yeah, he, he was, he traveled around yeah, the world. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he, he was lectured, that. and he, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so it was never going to expand because there's no way he could reach enough people. So he thought films, right? And um, but they didn't get get going on it till you were with him, Janice. What I think it was at La Quinta where they got where he actually first really got going. Yeah, in se early '78 when he came back from Spox, Nevada. Yeah, no, yes. Yeah, well, the GO had gotten raided in 77, and he took off to Sparks, and he wrote the script for Revolt in the Stars. <laughs> sorry, I read that script. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And then, and then he came back in January 78 with, and had already ordered the messengers to study the five Cs of cinematography. Interesting. He, uh, oh, wow. Do you and remember any of to study that? Do you remember any of the other references that he gave them? Not offhand, but I that was the main one that we had to study. Oh, there yeah, it is. It. It's a yeah. great book. It's yeah, no, it is. Book. If anybody out there wants to make a film, I don't care if you're using your cell phone or if you have a three hundred thousand dollar motion picture camera. You need to read yeah. this book. It's they eventually there was only thirty five thousand copies ever printed. This is a first edition with a cover and uh, a more info card on the inside right, right there. So it's probably pretty valuable, but- um, I, st I still use it, Mitch, to this day when I frame yeah. a photograph with yeah. my phone. You know, yeah, you gotta frame it, fill the frame, and you know, you compose yeah, it, the shot and all it's that. A, it's you know? yeah. Not, yeah, Continuity it's, and- Yeah. Yeah, the five C's- Cutting. Cinema, yeah, cutting. The, five, the five C's cinematographer are camera angles, cutting, composition, right. close-ups, and continuity. And then if you read the book, you'll discover the author mentions that there is a six C, which is called cheating, uh, yeah. which ha has a different definition <laughs> in filmmaking. Uh, but yeah. sometimes you have to move things around to get them to right. look right. That's, That's called right. cheating. Yeah. So, yeah. and I, I'd had this book when I first started studying film, so I was really familiar with it, right? Like I- I read it, I don't know how many times, and I was kind of delighted to find out that Hubbard picked up on it. And there were no copies then. They, they I think they made a deal with the publisher. Is that right, Mark, to, to Xerox we had We had to round them up. Yeah, you're right. We had to make copies. There was a number of materials that, you know, when he was going to come back on the lines, he was waiting for the all clear so that all the legal was done and he could come back to gold. As part of the preparation, uh, myself and a guy named Jason Bannock, we, we worked for Miscavige and we basically had to put together all the training materials for the cinema crew as well as the messengers who were going to be handling it. Right. One was the five C's, but there were other, there were other textbooks that I don't quite remember the names of um, that we had to get together. But then right. also we had to get, we had to get movies. We had, there were movies that he thought were tremendous. Yeah, 200. You know, yeah, and, and a lot of them were documentaries that um, 
Who's the guy that did uh, It's a Wonderful Life? Um, Frank Cochran. Frank Cochran did Hopper, a bunch yeah. of he did a bunch of documentaries during World War II to right. record people, yeah. and he, he the, we had to get all those because they were they're really great great films, you know. Yeah, so we yeah. put all that stuff together, and in those days it was just VCR videotapes. So we, yeah, we would we would actually take the film, and we had a we had to shoot we had to shoot the film in this thing that would then record it on video. You know, it was totally yeah. totally yeah. you know ancient, but that's how we got all the videos and and tapes together. Yeah, I know. I saw a lot of them. And then I also provided additional films for them. I, some of the films, I don't know why he put them on the list. It was just like ridiculous. Uh, yeah. I mean, because if you're only going to compile a list of 100 films, there's no reason to have. One of his favorite films that he wrote about endlessly was a film starring Bruce Stern called Silent oh, yeah. Running. Silent yeah, yeah, Running. Silent Running. Right. It's a yeah. good film. It's it's, yeah. But it's kind of like, it's funny, it was produced by the same company that made the film that I worked as a PA on for Peter Fonda. So I was mm -hmm. really familiar with it. I'd been out to the set and that it was about Bruce Stern is stranded on a giant uh, biosphere play, floating through space. And his yeah. only company is these three little robots that are kind of like R2-D2. So it was a little like somebody looked at Star Wars and said, well, one R2-D2 is good. How about three? So anyway, it was well, and if you think about it, that's that's around the time period that Star Wars came out, and he was doing Revolt in the Stars. And yeah. Thought, oh, yeah, sci-fi yeah, is coming yeah. back. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, the, the yeah. Silent Running is a good film. It's a legitimate yeah. film, but it's like if you're going to make a list of 100 films, there's no reason to put that on there. Here's well, here's I, a, uh, Mark Headley's in the house. He says techniques of film editing. That yeah, was technique book. technique of film editing by uh, Spottiswood is the guy's name. Roger Spottiswood, I think. Techniques of film lighting. Yeah, that, yeah, that was. I was about to say those, Mark. So you just cut. You, you, you beat me to it. it. I was just waiting for a spot. Yeah, it was Millerson's technique of film lighting, and Spottiswood's technique of film editing. And these, just so you know, these were standard film school textbooks. Like yeah. Hubbard didn't make some great discovery of some ancient lost wisdom. I mean, these were all books that I had in the school. And as Mark can tell you, when we finally go on. Uh, a lot of us spent a lot of time in cramming for, you know, being made to restudy stuff. It was just crazy. Yeah. But no, one of the problems is, is because everything that Hubbard said was so fixed in stone that there was a lot of material that um, they didn't, they disregarded because it wasn't part of that, that whatever you call it, you know, the syllabus that he created for studying and they had no technology about how to organize films. They tried to organize films based on how they organize their activities uh, in Scientology, and it just absolutely didn't work. And there's a wonderful book called The Film Director's Team, which is about the, the technology of production management. If any of you fledgling filmmakers are out there and you want to really understand, even on the smallest low production, small, you know, indie film, how you really organize and how it's done. This book, it was written by a guy named Elaine Silver, who was a top unit production manager and producer in, in LA. And he's also, a, like he wrote these amazing books. He wrote a book on the Samurai films. He wrote a book on uh, film to war. So he was just this real film lover. And he wrote this book, the, techni uh, the film director's team. And I'm like, boy, this is all the stuff Gold needs to, to know that they don't do. And so I wrote a CSW, you know, a proposal. I sent it to Miscavige and he approved it immediately. So I got this book approved as a, as a cine approved film book. And everybody got a copy and everybody uh, read it and nobody applied one thing from it. <laughs> but, you know, that's amazing. Well, in you one year and out, oh, I know, I know. No, no, because, uh, you know, like you said, everything Hubbard says is set in stone. And so, yeah. well, that's not on his list, even though he's dead. You know yeah. what I mean? And, yeah, you know, but, right. yeah, but fortunately nothing in it was, as we, as they would say, off source. Yeah. Uh, nothing in it contradicted Hubbard. No, it was no. just stuff that he was missing. No, it's just the roboticness of like, yeah, well, exactly. it's not exactly. on the list and so it can't be approved. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, what had happened was um, I was starting to use the book with the production team say, hey, look at this, look at this. And then somebody wrote a knowledge report on me that I was citing non-Hubbard sources. So mm -hmm. my solution to that was I wrote a CSW, sent it to Miscavige, and he approved it as a book. So, yeah. so then I was no longer in trouble. So 
that. Well, I was just going to say, any, like you said, anybody out there, if you love movies and cinema, you should read these books if you're really interested in it because it, it gives you a greater appreciation of the craft and how they put the artistry and how they put together these films and these movies. Yeah, yeah. I always I always love watching the behind the scenes documentary, you know, like when they do a movie and then they have a behind the scenes. I love watching those things because yeah. I can relate to a lot of the stuff that I learned, which was just we were crappy. You know what I mean? But I, I at least understand what they're talking about and what they're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, of, of, of those textbooks, I would not recommend Millerson's lighting book unless you're seriously <laughs> going to light a film because that thing is dense and you're going to have to do some serious study. The book on the technique of film editing is amazing. It's the history of film editing. And it's a lot of, there's a lot of theory. And I don't care if you're editing a, a film on your phone, the theory of editing still applies. So we're not talking about the technical, although there is technical stuff in it, but the technique of film editing is an acclaimed book and it's, it's about the theory. But speaking of theory, the film theory, to my delight, Hubbard had on their um, Sergei Eisenstein's Film Forum, which is a collection of essays written by the Russian filmmaker, I don't know, probably back in 1919, which I had read in college and then continued to read every so many years, I would go back and read. Uh, you can find it as uh, film form, film sense, put together in one volume, which are two compendium. There are two collections of Eisenstein's uh, essays. And I mean, he's the guy who invented editing. He's the guy who invented yeah. the montage. He's the guy that basically invented film as when it stopped becoming 10 minute reels that never moved, the camera was fixed. He's the guy that did that. And so it's, his insights into film theory are absolutely amazing. So I you kids, you kids who are making YouTube videos, <laughs> God damn it, you listen to grandpa. You go get a copy of Sergei Eisenstein's film forum and God damn it, you read it. And you and I want a, a book report sent to Scientology of the Big Lie, gmail.com. Hey, I have a I have a you reminded me of a you reminded me of a funny, funny <laughs> Yeah, when you were there, of course. Do you remember Wilson Iguez and Isadora Ramirez? They were the gaffers. Oh yeah, absolutely. On the city for oh, I just we just used to laugh because Wilson would be going like, "Izzy, Izzy, get down from there, get down from yeah. there." You know what I mean? <laughs> They're moving the different lights. Yeah, yeah. Around. Wilson was uh, he had a bit of a temper problem. Uh, he, he used to explode. I just, you just reminded me that I had those pictures because when I was on the set, it was always Wilson running around barking orders on the gaffing. And yeah, the, easy, the easy. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wilson was a great guy. He was from uh, uh, not Ecuador, somewhere in South America. Well, and I heard Izzy, Izzy got uh, offloaded into Mexico. Oh, boy. He right. got so much trouble. He got okay. what? He got in so much trouble. This guy, Izzy, was like... Izzy, get down from the... God damn it. <laughs> Mark Headley. Yeah, yeah, Izzy, get down from the... God damn it. Yeah, so Izzy... This is why, Mark, we have to do this to you, because Mark and I know all this stuff. Um, yeah, so Izzy was... He was like a magnet for trouble. You know, like... The, he, he, like... Uh, uh, he was driving down the Hollywood freeway in the big grip truck. Big truck, right? And uh, With a... a uh, pulling a, a big Jenny, a big film generator behind it, and the Jenny broke off and went sliding all over the Hollywood freeway, created a huge mess. He got major trouble over that. But then, what led to his downfall is we were shooting interviews uh, at Celebrity Center. We were using the beautiful rooms to interview people, and then everybody went to dinner, and Izzy f didn't turn all the lights off. And one of the lights, uh, there was a, a very sort of gauzy curtain, a sheer curtain next to the light that caught fire. And it started a fire at Celebrity Center. And as a result, they had to interrupt sessions, auditing sessions, and evacuate oh. the building. <laughs> and it's already a criminal in Scientology to stop someone's session. But Izzy stopped the whole goddamn org. So they got rid of him really quick. I mean, he was he was disappeared back to his home country. Yeah. You know, Mitch, there weren't many films that were finished before you became the director. Okay, yeah, but I, know. I do remember. Yeah. I do remember the film that was done. Do you remember the film with Michael Fairman and Jeff Pomerantz, where there are all these world leaders meeting around? A yeah, yeah, yeah. Table it's called. Uh, it. It's <laughs> called. Hey, Headley, help me out. No, it's called. Yeah, it was the summit of world leaders. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the yeah, Scientologist yeah. Jeff Pomerantz comes in and you know he says solves how the world's problems. Save thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, yeah. That's such a we horrible have to come script. Up with it. 
Yeah, that was yeah, such but, a horrible. That, they actually they actually did a pretty good job on it. Yeah, for it wasn't the time too bad. Well, I mean, Jeff was a decent actor, and Michael Thurman was an excellent actor. So I did a bunch of work with Michael Thurman. He left years ago, and he was uh, no, he never did it. A CC it made confess. <gasps> I through your Mike, I re oh, uh, Mark, I remember this. Oh my God, I just my memory she is set just. The room see, I, knew, fire? I knew Mark would bail me out. Check this out. So Izzy uh -huh. never did what I said he did. Yeah, a, confess a years later on the RPF, she had set the room on fire by turning on the light after he had left the room for a meal. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> so, but is he still got? Is he still? Yeah, he still got. Yeah, he yeah, still got but offered. but in the long run, I'm sure Izzy was like thanking that maid for getting him the hell out of there. You know, <laughs> in spite of the pain that he went through exactly. to do that. Yeah, Mark Headley. What was the name of that movie? Uh, it ended up awful. The Mexican rumor has it. Oh no! And there I was hoping the best for him. That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, good yeah. Movie. I don't know what the name, but you know that film it actually was pretty good. You know, for the time, you know, because yeah. was I think it was Joe Canine or somebody yeah. directing the thing, and I yeah. just remember it, you know, because uh, we had different guys like Eric Gottman was the German representative and and all that. Uh, anyway, yeah, it was called <laughs> The Summit. I think it was. Was that ring a bell? Yeah, I, I don't know, but but I just remember it because we we actually got one done. The other the other one that I remember was the football one where we had a a, a, a professional actor come up and he yeah. gets he gets tackled. And I'm yeah. actually in that film, but then of course really? it got reached out. No, I was an orderly. It was like a football, like in the 1950s, and they were all old. Yeah, it's stuff, called right? Evolution of a Science. Yeah, and uh, I was an orderly wheeling him down, you know, yeah. through the hospital yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and Noel North was in that one, I think. Noel, too. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I forget the the guy's name was Gary. I he was a pro actor of science. Gary Imhoff. Yeah, that was him. Yeah, yeah. those are yeah. the two that I remember. <laughs> yeah, that one. That one. Those are pretty decent. I mean, I did. I, we never did the summit. It was one of these ones. You know, I, I proposed a lot of planning, like I was asked, uh, like. Um, Mark's saying the story of book one. I don't know if that's right. No. But yeah. No. Oh, here. Oh. Uh, and then Evolution of a Science was with Gary Imhoff. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. 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 And then we redid it with David O'Donnell uh, playing that part. We, we redid it with. I just remember shooting the football out, out by the lake. You know what I mean? On the ground. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Gary actually got hurt when he got tackled on his neck. Yeah. If I'm oh, he did. Afraid. No, he broke his ankle. I remember. No, I remember. He. Uh, I heard it because I worked with Gary on. So the first film I did, which was called Start, Change, and Stop, right? Which is uh -huh. about objective auditing. Gary started. He would already been cast. He started that film and he told me the story about about uh, how he put yeah, his ankle. Uh, yeah. Okay, now, how, here's another one. Uh, did you ever see the film? I don't know if Ella Ray shot it or if David Rousseau shot it. The one where David Mayo plays like Humphrey Bogart, you know. Yeah, that mean? made it that, that was that was that made it into orgs. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, it was yeah. actually yeah. pretty pretty at the time. It was pretty cool the way they shot it. I think yeah. David Rousseau was the uh, director on it. I'm not sure, but uh yeah. yeah, no, and then then of course when Mayo left, that that all had to get you know. Yeah, that was of. that was um, the E Meter Reads film. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, there was a, a few films. I'm sure Headley will remember. Uh, there was E Meter Reads. There was uh, PC Indicators. And the tone scale. No, no, that had a, a a CS speak at the beginning. Like they were written so that a CS came out and did a very pontificated and then at the end of the film he came back and pontificated some more and so david mayo had done that but for some reason they chose to establish him as a gangster he as a kind of a humphrey boat like a hard-boiled detective yeah. character it was yeah. really like silly yeah. yeah and then it had it was it was properly lit unlike most of the other films but it, the lighting style was like uh, what they what they used for uh, soap operas, yeah, where you light everything because you don't know where the actors are going to go. So, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, it was just horrible. That's enough of those. I just those are ones I just remember as we talk. I mean, it happens all the time. Whenever we talk, somebody yeah, says, "Yeah, I know." Oh, just, yeah, you remember this, and yeah, 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 you yeah. Know. <laughs> And then you have Mark Headley, who's got like like Sterling and I were commenting that his memory, he has this insane memory, and so it's just like. 
Well, he's saying here, here he is. Here right we go. Here. The, the films, the films that Ellery shot look like they were sponsored by Kraft. No, 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 not that good. No, I thought they looked like um, they were shot by the kids who came on the short bus, like literally like children putting on a school play. They were so bad. I, there was another film I, too where there were dolls, big dolls. Did yeah, you yeah, that, that yeah, too? yeah. I that one yeah. was done, and then I redid it with starring Danny Masterson. So, ah, ooh, well, that 15, one's been redone, well, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Fifteen-year-old Danny <laughs> Masterson. Mark worked on that I, film. Headley, you worked on that film, right? I'm sure you did, Mark. You must have. Were you going to say something, Janice? Well, I was going to say those films. I acted in some of those films. Oh yeah. The 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 one of the Puritans with the big fires and. Um, oh, that was you were in Man the Unfathomable. Yeah. Is that That's the what one? That, yeah. Yeah, where they burned then, the witch. They burned yes. the witch at the stake. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then I was I was also in the one which was supposed to be done in Africa. Mm. And I was I How was to the set up a session lady. in email. You were the witch? I was, I was the laundry lady in a yellow gown. Oh, that wait a minute. Popped that, out. That, and I had a thing wrapped around my head and cotton wool stuck up my nose and all my skin was made brown. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, okay. Well, keep that Mark? comment up. Keep Mark's comment up. Don't yeah. leave it yet. I want to finish with Janice and then I want to address Debbie, Mark's comment. What had happened actually is someone had messed up on the script. And so as a penalty, every messenger had to have a part they were assigned to be pickaninnies. Oh, in yeah. The film. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Listen, it's so yeah. racist. It's no, so listen, racist. It was. Yeah, but Janice, so, the laundry lady was a black woman. It was supposed to be a black woman. And that's why my skin did was. Did they all, put did they put you in blackface? They yeah. Put in black oh my face. god. Like, and they put cotton, cotton so on my nose to make it wider. Hubbard was such a racist. It's just like people oh, yeah. don't realize. Oh, yeah. I did. I did not know that that he actually put you guys in blackface. I mean, when I did the film and I shot it twice, the first time because Larry Anderson started it and he left, and even the second time, the guy who replaced Larry, Larry Anderson wasn't an actor, wasn't a Scientologist. We needed to go so, do some pickup shots with him later to upgrade the film, and he told us to fuck off. He's like, "I won't work with you guys. You're an evil cult." So it was. <laughs> but um, when I did that film, when I read the script, and there's a description of uh, a woman and two children right like a native african like a, like an indigenous person uh in a, in this african fictitious african village of mahali arafiki was the name of the village um and in the script it said that they were eating they were peeling and eating bananas it was so racist and he described the children as pickaninas so yeah. i had i had cast because i insisted on casting black africans who looked authentic and which means they'd all have to be from the same region, like not from South central LA where everybody's going to look different, right. Or Hollywood, anywhere else, in Los Angeles. Right. So we found this group uh, from uh, 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 the, an African nation, West African nation. I forgot which one. There were a group of musicians and actors that live in North Hollywood, California. So I hired them because they all look so authentic. I had to get permission to change the script, to take the lines picking any out because they were all going to read it. <laughs> and I was like, people, we can't. It's terrible, yeah. Yeah, I was, it was really I was bad. still stuck in the 30s, well, you know. Yeah, and I don't crazy. know why I was there. I mean, I was like, my my parents have pictures of me at civil rights marches when I was five years old. Like, what the <laughs> hell was I doing there? But um, anyway, it was just, I, I yeah, am so did. shocked that he had you in blackface. Yeah. Oh, you, oh yeah. Well, well will you please put that in your next book, please? I, yeah. You, you need I to put that in your gotten, next. Yeah, you need to I write about about, about what a racist he was <laughs> and how he put you guys. He made the messengers play black people in black plays. Mama, yeah. this is horrible. Oh yeah. my god. So here, yeah. here's Mark's comment. Oh yeah, here it was. Behold. Yeah, in the oh, doll, film, the doll yeah, film. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was the sex checker, but you know, the interrogator who but he was the one who cleaned up Danny Masterson's character. Uh so hey, I guess we can blame Mark for everything that happened. Uh, but, <laughs> and that was right before I joined the film. Oh, the okay, cool. Chief. So I wonder who was the shoe crew chief then? I guess it was 
Barbara Mace, maybe? I, I think it might have been Barbara Mace. Uh, well, I'm sure you know Mark could remember. Mark also says he was an actor in this one here. I was an actor. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Wrong room. Yeah. There's a great room, scene. Guy. There's a great scene where one of the messengers walks in the auditing hut, the set where Larry Anderson was. And he just, it's this little bit that's supposed to be humorous that Hubbard wrote in. A guy just barges in and says, wrong room. He, he looks and he says, oh, wrong room, and then leaves. It's just a random thing. And Mark did it, and he was absolutely hysterical. I wish I had the shot. And that became a meme at Gold. Like, everybody would say that. We'd barge into a room and go, wrong room, and then we'd leave. So, <laughs> yeah, Mark inspired, like, this more than one meme, I'm telling you. But we had, oh, we had do you remember, we had a lot of quotable lines from those films, like these ridiculous lines, like, well, I, I'll never, I'll never forget DM quoting from EM one before it was shot, uh, the line about uh, you could walk out of the room oh, yeah, and not from get involved in Scientology, yeah. or you could blow your brains out. It wouldn't be smart, but you could do it, or something like that. Yeah, I, it, it was. It. Yeah, that was from orientation. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> I can never forget the line, and it goes like this: You can walk out of this room. Without after seeing this film and never mention Scientology again, you can do it, but it would be stupid. You could also jump off a bridge or blow out your brains. So <laughs> crazy. Yeah, pretty nice. We remade the film and took the line out, but it was uh, yeah, it didn't was go over. Well. Who did that, right? Larry Anderson. Yeah, was the Larry of that. Anderson. Yeah. Great guy. Larry was a great guy. He was uh he was Absolutely. badly he was very mistreated before he left. You know, I was just going to say, though, because you made this point earlier in another video that we did that, you know, they had all these training materials and, and you were wondering, why couldn't these cine crew members do all yeah. that? And you mentioned the fact that because they were penalized, yeah. they messed up. They were never allowed to learn right. and then and, and make mistakes and then learn from them and learn again. They were just they'd be completely kicked out anytime yeah. they did something wrong. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's what I refer to as um, the high cost of failure. Uh, I was uh, somebody you know, not to mention names, whatever. Um, I asked one day somebody who worked very closely with me, who was a script supervisor, who was probably the person that became my first friend at Gold. Uh, you know, as close as you could get to having friends, right? Because at the end of the day, you can't confide in people because, you know, they may be in a position where they have no choice but to report you for something or even make something up to get themselves out of trouble. But anyway, I was talking to her one day and I said, I don't get it. I've only been up there for a few weeks. I said, I don't get it. You know, you guys have all these great facilities and you have all these training materials and being a director of Hubbard's films would be like, that's a coveted job, right? You get extra perks, you're respected. And I said, well, how come nobody wants to do it? I mean, I come from an environment where there's a line of guys behind me ready to stab you in the back and take your job. But yeah. you know, it just doesn't exist here. And she said, oh, because you can get in so much trouble for doing that. So, and that's where I really began to discover that they place such a high cost on failure because you just didn't miss do a shot, which had to be redone, which at gold is cheap because the crew is paid nothing and right. they, they own their equipment and eventually they had their own lab. So redoing a shot for the most part was relatively inexpensive. I mean, unless you'd, hired a, an expensive location and a bunch of extras right and, and yet there was no opportunity you know there it, it is a fact that artists need a space in which they can fail in order to truly learn w how to be authentically expressing themselves that is not allowed to exist in the sea world and as much as they hated hiring pros and as much as they were fearful um as much as yeah hold that combat as much as they were they were fearful of the outside influence the professionals might bring. Eventually, they had to capitulate and hire a lot of pros, and they hired more and right. more. I brought some in by the time we opened Scientology Media Productions. I mean, all the key positions there were staffed. The key creative positions were all staffed by professionals, especially journalists, you know, film directors, writers. Uh, so Mark says, yeah, we had to pay for film and processing on reshoots. If we cause them, yeah, that's horrible. I, I, mean, I was once had a query of ethics and I had to cough up two grand for it to reshoot a, a sequence that I, I literally had nothing to do with what went wrong. It was all 
a couple of executives bad decisions and then you know i didn't even want to go through with the shoot i'm like no i don't want to do this and it's like well you have to i'm like okay and then like well you screwed it up you need to pay us two thousand dollars to re i was like super pissed yeah but the, along with what mark is uh, what mark henley is saying there in the dining room at gold where you bust your dishes right you, you after mm -hmm. dinner you go and you scrape it there's a there's a price list on what a plate cost what a what a teacup cost what a salad bowl cost if you break it like a dinner plate's 18 bucks there's a sign there you break a dinner plate you're gonna pay 18 bucks we're paying you 43 dollars and change every week and you break a plate we're gonna charge you 18 bucks and it's just like that I used to look at that and think that is just sick. Ridiculous. But I got I billed for so. a cow and a calf for TR1 battlefield shoot. Oh, no way, Mark. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mark. You're making that up. You come online with me and we'll talk about that. Okay, so what <laughs> you got charged for the cow? <laughs> oh, so here's what happened in this film, TR1, which is called Tears in Life. There's a bunch of stories about that film, but the film opens up with a, a, a recreation of a battle from World War II. And the idea is that communication can break down so badly that, you know, bullets start to fly. And we went all out. We hired... <laughs> that cow was not worth $1,500, Mark. You got totally taken. And so we did this battle scene, and I was... like, This was before Saving Private Ryan, but I was trying to do the beach in Normandy. I mean, I had we had explosions going off, and guys being blown into the air and it was crazy and even though we told all the local authorities so they didn't they were all calling 911 um you know gold is close to some dairy farms and i heard the two cows drop dead from from the explosions <laughs> and that there was some kind of a he said there was a stampede <laughs> yeah, yeah. well mark would know better than me because he's the first one they would contact me you know they'd be shielding me from the bad stuff like, don't look over there, Mitch. Look over there. Look over there. So, yeah, appreciate your sharing that. There was a stamp. That's funny. You know, you know, uh, Mitch, when we did our first interview with you, you mentioned the story about Mark Headley picking a lock. You know what I mean? Picking yeah, 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 a lock yeah, yeah. to get in that. And, yeah. and so the next the next day or later that night, he was on a live stream and people were asking him, like, hey, I heard you're a good lock picker. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a true story. Come on, Mark, admit it. I mean, I no, he did. He did remember it, but it was just yeah, like, I mean, oh, my, Mitch, Mitch mentioned it. No, my first thought was, I want this guy on my crew always, like anybody <laughs> that's that resourceful, because it's just you're running into problems constantly. And Mark's job, he had to solve a lot of problems. Janice, you've lost focus. I know. I don't know how to fix it. Oh, okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll put up with it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anyway, uh, so okay, yeah, great. so yeah, Mark, he was very, uh, very resourceful well, says, in that way. Here he's right here. I grew up in Hollywood. I could pick a lock, no problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah Mark, I grew up in Hollywood too, but I think it's more because you grew up on Hollywood Boulevard. Well, so. Claire said, Claire said that whenever there was a briefcase that needed to be opened, it would be brought to Mark to try and pick the lock and open it. Yeah, I'm, yeah, he was a problem solver. I mean, I told the story about when we were shooting on Bureau of Land Management property we weren't supposed to be on, and. Mark, you know, the, the BLM guys came and they're like federal cops. I mean, these guys are serious. Like they're packing guns and blah, blah, blah. They protect, you know, federal uh, land, right? And we were not supposed to be on that land. And, you know, Mark like sat in the back of a, of a BLM patrol car for 20 minutes holding them off while we finished our shooting. So. <laughs> Before he went to jail? <laughs> no, no, no. They were cool. We, we all, we, no, eventually, you know, as long as we got out of there, but he managed to kind of keep them busy for long enough for us to finish our shot. So that's was, great. He was Listen, a good guy got, to have on your crew. Absolutely. We've got some questions. Let's go ahead and answer them real quickly. So other we'll be here all night because we can talk oh. about this forever. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was going to mention is that uh, Janice's book is available. This is her book there. That's her with her flood pants with L. Ron Hubbard on the <laughs> flagship Apollo. And that's book one and book two. They're both available on our merchandise store. So if you want to buy her book, it's autographed. You can get both of them personally autographed to you. Uh, you just go to our store, click that screen link on our YouTube page and we've got other merchandise as well. We've got t-shirts, coffee mugs, you name it. We've got it all, but the books are very popular. So if you're interested in her books, that's where you go. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's go comment, ahead. Mark, Mark yeah. there's comments on me being blurry. 
I think yeah, you are blurry. Why don't you exit exit out and then come oh. back in? Okay, I can do that. Let's see if that does it. Yeah, it might be her phone has is uh, doing something funny. Yeah, she's got a camera, not a. Oh, phone, okay. But anyway. She might have to turn it off and turn it back on. Uh, I may have to send her another invite. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I'll do that real quick. That's complicated. Sorry yeah. about that, everybody. We have technical difficulties here. We try and <laughs> yeah, yeah. All of us, all of us, former media pros. Uh, well, I mean, you know, you guys all worked around that stuff. I mean, I, I don't think people realize, Mark, that, that Hubbard actually set up Golden Air Productions specifically to make those twenty-six films. Yeah. So, so the that there was, she is. She's back. And you're in awesome. focus. Yeah, there yeah, you yeah. go. <laughs> so that was just a massive failure that they were unable to make those films. <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's, sure. like I said, that was why we set up, you know, like I said, that was one of the responsibilities I had in my office was getting all the study materials together, not only just for films, but also for audio, you know, all the mixing right, and right, the audio right, recording right. and all that. We put all that stuff together. And, and Russ Williams, a guy in senior CS Int office in RTRC, he reminded me of that. And I'd forgotten that, yeah, we put that together. It was myself and Jason Bennett, who a lot of people don't like, and he worked good for me, but later on he became <laughs> not such a nice guy. But anyway, yeah. but yeah, we put all that stuff together. Yeah, I knew uh -huh. Jason when he was the uh, he was the CEO of Gold, and you know, other than yeah, he being was a, he was a good old boy from the South. I mean, uh, he was like a, he was like a huge like uh, what do you call it? You know, uh, the, the racing. You know, the what do they call it? South. You know the good old boys race in the South and those oval tracks. Stock car drivers. Yeah. I don't know why I can't think of it, but he, he, he always wanted to drive, be, be a race car driver. And he was a bit of a racist and he was like a good old boy, friendly guy oh, yeah. who was a bit of a racist. And, but you know, eventually he left, they paid him off and he still says nice things about them. Like he's, yeah. well, he started, he's, he, I looked up his website recently. I mean, he's got, he's a CEO of about five businesses and who knows what the heck they are. You know, he's in crypto, he's in this, he's in that, yeah. you know, it's yeah. just funny. But you know, when he worked for me, you know, he, he was, he could get things done, but I would always hear stories after the fact I would leave and then he would be really mean to people. And he never did that in front of me. And I yeah. found that out later. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark Headley. He reminded me it's NASCAR. I don't know how I could have forgotten that, but my brain sort of stops working when I'm looking That's into cool. a camera. But yeah, he was right. a big NASCAR fan. We're going to go to some questions here real quick, okay? Uh, first of all, Nita Peep, thanks for the super sticker. We appreciate it. We've got a super chat as well from Lena One. Pickaninny is definitely a racial slur. Absolutely. Uh, Janice Absolutely. Ellerich made you do a blackface. Damn, no wonder there wasn't a lot more black Scientologists, you know, it's, it is pretty wild. Yeah. Know? Except for the NOI. They, yeah, they didn't I was going to say, that, imagine but... Louis Farrakhan finding out about these movies that Hubbard did. Well, how do you, I don't know, wonder how we think about that. Yeah, Well, that's probably why no one gets to see them. <laughs> well, my, anymore. my theory is the NOI got in so they could capture, um, FSM commissions from getting other people into Dianetics. I, uh, it's just, they don't give a shit about Scientology. It's just a total joke. They just want to get their people in and because come on, it's just, it's, you can make more money than selling pies. I don't want to be yeah. talking down a group, but I'm not a big fan of the NOI because they're, they are yeah. uh, considered to be the most anti Semitic uh, group Correct. in America. I know. Well, and you the, know, white, the white man is associated the, with the Scientology, which is, you yeah, know, which is called. really bizarre. It makes no sense. And the weird thing is, is that Scientologists think, no, 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 it's good because they're going to be good people. We just have to handle the reactive mind. I mean, they, this is what they believe. This is why they're so willing to excuse all that and to associate themselves with a vehemently racist group. Yeah. Anyway, if any of your viewers aren't aware of this, the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, they're, they're involved with Scientology and they have big been time. years. Yeah, Big which is involved. Tony Muhammad, who's like number two in the yeah. whole group. He just finished OT2. He's like won a freedom medal. It's just, anyway, it makes me want to throw Pretty up crazy. in my mouth. Okay, yeah, I remember, that, I, I remember seeing Farrakhan. He came to the one of the CC galas when we used to do that, right? Uh, he was there with his entourage, and there was like a sniper. What a, like he had a sniper on the roof as a bodyguard because this guy is, uh, you know, he's, he's, He's in the crosshairs of a lot of people that don't like bigots. 
Absolutely. Anyway, thanks very much, Lena, for that question. we got a question here from Xenuite, formerly Diane uh, Valencilio. Question, Mitch, do you ever sleep? I see you on at night and now. Love you, Mitch, really. Just wondering. <laughs> uh, that's kind of my superpower is that I live on very little sleep. And uh, I just, I stay busy. I, I just, I don't really sleep. It's just like, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm one of those descendants of Eastern European Jews, like, like who have horrible insomnia. There's a whole bunch of us. Like Winona Ryder is another one. I read about her. And it's just this thing of like these descendants of like Ashkenazi Jews that like apparently we all suffer from really bad insomnia. So I don't, rather than trying to sleep, I do sleep maybe four hours a night. But, but, the, but more importantly, I appreciate that you're noticing that I'm on a lot. That's the important part. <laughs> that is good. And subscribe to his channel. Subscribe yeah, to please. our channel. We're, we just went over 7,600. We need 400 more to hit 8,000. I mean, I know Mark's Mark's at 40,000. Mike is just at 30,000. We're way behind, you know. So if you're watching and you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button for me and hit that subscribe button for Mitch. You know, he's got a great channel, yep. too. Yeah. And what Rock else, Janice? Slam the like. Rock That's slam right. The Rock like. slam those likes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. All you rock slammers, hit that bell. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, that Mitch, we have in our merchandise store. Uh, we 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 uh, adopted the term rock slammer, and we have a rock slammer T-shirt. You oh, know, nice. so if anybody wants to nice. know, yeah, I designed a, a female rock slammer and that's a male T-shirt rock good slammer. One. Yeah, 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 that's a good. So anyway, one. yeah, it's a rock slammer, and it's got a fist like this, so it's it's pretty cool. Anyway, okay, uh, so this is from uh, Argo Serlin, the back seat. Janice, it would be great if, to see that photo. I was only 10 and read Jonathan Siegel, and that dress was so incredible in my young eyes. She's talking about the okay. dress uh, of your mother. With the seagull on it. Yeah. yeah. She got Danielle, that because she just loved that Jonathan Siegel book. Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, I'll find the picture. John, Danielle, Danielle Chamberlain, a member of our channel. Hi, Danielle. Uh, and she's actually, we're going to be doing an interview with her uh, tomorrow, right, Janice? We're going to be recording it yep. and we'll be putting it out later. But that's uh, Danielle is a longtime uh, former Scientology Sea Org member. Uh, question, Mitch, do you think if LRH were still have been in charge, would you have left? Probably I would have left sooner because that, <laughs> that guy was such a nut and he was so tasteless. And his ideas about film were so crazy that, that I mean, at least Miss Gavage was smart enough to kind of figure out how to have a conversation about things, right? Like once he would, Miss Gavage had no taste. He was the most tasteless person I ever met. He had no taste in architecture, no taste in clothing, because, you know, he in the environment that he grew up in, he grew up in a chaotic household with an abusive father. He had joined the Sea Org at 13. Where did he ever have time to learn cultural things or taste? So he'd get these from other people. I mean, it's eventually he hired, he'd get it from me. Like I would talk to him endlessly. But and then once he, uh, he absorbed some cultural fact that would guide one's taste, then he would make it his own and he was an expert. Where Hubbard, on the other hand, he just decided how the world was. It was the world according to L. Ron Hubbard and, and his taste was everybody's taste. And I couldn't stand that. So I'm sure if he was around, because I would have had to work with him, I would have gotten the hell out, out of there sooner because I don't think I would have been able to tolerate him. You know, eventually I realized that that would have, that really literally would have been the case. I probably would have gotten out far, far sooner if he was around. Now, Janice, uh, you were around. Uh, uh, Hubbard actually had a relationship with Milton Casellas, right? The director. Uh, yeah, yeah. They uh, Milton came to the ship, and he brought with him his script he was working on, Butterflies Are Free, and they massaged that script together, and then Milton went back and filmed it with Goldie Hawn, right? And I think and Eddie Albert or yeah. Edward Albert. Mm -hmm. And uh, then once that was finished, Milton set it up so that the Lisbon Theater was privately rented out to us. And LRH and all the crew from the ship, we went that evening into Lisbon and uh, watched the film. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there's a comment in here. I think you guys. Uh, Did I miss it? From Vegan 3. What does this mean? LRH never would have hired outsiders after the <laughs> Hartwells. Who were the Hartwells? Ernie and Adele. 
Ernie, Ernie and Adele Hartwell, uh, they were from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. their, uh -huh. their oldest daughter, Mary Gay, was the ED of Las Vegas Org and is still a Scientologist, but Adele and Ernie, Adele was in costumes. I guess she did it in uh, here in Vegas. But they didn't like the way Hubbard operated and yelled and screamed at the crew while doing the filming. And they ended up blowing and going to the press. And yep. the press is who showed up at La Quinta. Hubbard took and off. That's Hubbard and that's, took off. <laughs> and so that's they, when he ended up at X in Hemet. And everybody else moved to uh, to um, MCI, Gilman to Hot Gilman Springs. Hot Springs. Right. We, so had, he, we had already bought Gilman Hot Springs because that was supposed to become our summer headquarters. And right. in winter, we would be in La Quinta. Right. But the Hartwells having gone to the press, that blue having two locations, and we all ended up over at one. Interesting. Interesting. So just as a side note for people out there, La Quinta is about 60 miles away from Gilman Hot Springs. And the average temperature difference during the summer is 10 degrees. So... <laughs> Think about that. Winter headquarters. Oh, we need to go to winter headquarters where it's only 100 because here at summer headquarters, it's 110. Yeah, you know, you know, La Quinta was much hotter. I mean, I've been there in the middle of the it summer. Was. It yeah, was but if you're really going to do it, yeah. yeah, but Mark, if you're going to do a winter I, headquarters. No, I, you know, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, you you're going to go to the, go go to the beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't go to the other side of the yeah. mountain. Yeah. Yeah, it was the know, other side of the mountain. <laughs> that always used to crack me up. Like, I can never figure that out when I was there. I'm like, huh. But anyway, so, yeah, but I just have to say in terms of this comment about the Hartwells, I get it. Um, but there were, after Hubbard finished the technical training films, he started writing these public films, right? Mm -hmm. Like the film Orientation, Jump Off a Cliff or Blow Out Your Brains or like The Man, The Unfathomable, these really silly films that he was intending to show to the general public to bring them in, right? And I made a few of these films, but they were having such a problem getting those films that Hubbard did write some internal advices on hiring pros. And those mm -hmm. advices is what H Miscavige used to then turn the ship. Justify you know, why you did Yeah, it. turn the ship around. And so uh, very specific advices. So, uh, cause then, yeah. you know, I, I, anyway, I was shown those and I'm like, okay, cool. And so, Mitch, Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I recall Hubbard didn't even really write. He wrote treatments, right, for all the films. No, he no, he did write. No, he he, ab have... he did both. He absolutely wrote. Like, okay, okay the film that Janice was in, Blackface. <laughs> I, I can never get that picture out of my mind. As you, at, how old were you? Like sixteen or something? No, no, I was, 20. I was 19, okay. twenty. Okay, 19, okay, 20, okay, yes. okay. Okay, so, little messenger Janice hopping around who'd just gone from hot pants and go-go boots on the ship, and now she's in blackface on the set. It's just, it's more than I can bear. But um, anyway, it's just, he wrote, the reason I brought that up is he wrote that script. That was a very detailed script. Yeah. Not only did he write the script, but Janice, you were probably there when David Rousseau tried to shoot the film, and the film was scripted so that there were shots looking over like a camera here, looking yeah. over Hubbard's Hubbard's uh, shoulder at his writing and they recorded all of that and then I used that as a guide for when when I shot the film so it was incredibly detailed that film was so detailed that his old collaborator Lenny Riefenstahl the Hitler's favorite propagandist who directed the Triumph of the Will mm -hmm. a whole different story um it, and he had written to her she was in Africa Lenny Riefenstahl was in Africa doing a book of photography and he wrote her a letter. I know this for a fact because I have her response letter. Um, I'm probably the only person outside the church who has this stuff. But uh, thank you, David Miscavige, for giving it to me. And I have a gift card to prove that I didn't steal it. So <laughs> fuck off. Anyway, so um, anyway, she had written him this response saying, uh, 1980, I'm sorry. And that would have been when he was writing a script. No, Janice? Yeah. Like 1980, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. So he, oh, hang yeah. on. No, he left in uh, around February 80, so he would have been writing the script earlier. Yeah, but... You're he, talking about re, hang on, you're talking about Revolting the Stars? No, 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 no. I'm talking about how to set up a session in the E-meter. The film... Oh, you know, the tech film. 78. 78. Oh, okay, so he had written to her, and she didn't reply until 1980, and she said, no, I'm sorry, 
I was never in that part of Africa. I can't provide you with any photos. And he was obviously seeking visual research from her. She said, I'll give you photos of other parts of Africa. But so he was very detailed about this script, right down to the description of the location. A number of the films, Protiars, uh, and then a bunch he wrote treatments for, and then we kind of figured orientation. He never wrote a script. That was all right. from a treatment. Yeah. But he, that's the way he did music too. His music was like, yeah, he'd, he'd sketch come it up out. with a little, well, he'd sketch it out on a little yeah. keyboard and he'd dictate the stuff and then the musicians would arrange it. Yeah. yeah. If you like some of the films I know that I did, that it's a score by L. Ron Hubbard. If you ever heard what the musicians heard, that they then. I've scored, heard it. I've heard them. It's, it's like it's like it's like going ding 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 ding. You know, it's like a kitty thing. Yeah, and then there's Crazy. a full orchestrated. Somebody takes it and turns it into something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I meant if the audience ever heard it, I'm you heard everything. You heard things yeah. that I never heard. That's for sure. Yeah, the whole Road to Freedom album was like that. You know, okay, we, so we had to put that whole thing together. I have to add, I have to, to, to address this Moon Gage Daydream Moon Age Daydream question about how the heck is DM giving away. LRH artifacts as gifts. Um, so, no, I got a copy. They're just copies, what he sent me. I was reading Reefer Schell's biography, 1989, 92 book biography, whatever, huge, thick book. And um, so, yeah, I was reading a biography, and there's a, there's a passage in the biography where she talks about meeting Hubbard and the, the wonderful Dr. Hubbard. He's a PhD, he's a psychologist, he's the head of an international organization that has millions of followers. It's just crazy. And so I looked at it, I sent it to Miscavige and then, uh, cause I didn't know if he knew about that she talked about Hubbard. And then he sent me down a folder, big thick folder with the script that he rewrote it. He helped her rewrite a, a, her most famous film. It, it's a whole, I don't want to get, it's a lot of details. If we get off into it, we'll be here for another four hours. Yeah, that's fine. But um, yeah, so it wasn't, he's not giving away artifacts. Yet. I was sent just a Xerox copy of, of all of it. I understand. Yeah, All right, here's a comment. Next comment, uh, Annesley. Uh, there's something very genuine and sincere hearing you three tell your truth. Janice's mother sounded like a wonderful woman who truly wanted to help others. Yeah, yeah. thank you very yeah, much. That's a nice comment. Yeah. yeah, and then here's another, uh, Jen, who's a member of our channel. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Mitch was nice meeting you after the Broken Brothers documentary. What a great film! Also, nice to see Janice speak briefly in it, right? You yeah, were in the film? yeah, she was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very yes, briefly, yeah. I was in there. Yes, I met Jen. Uh, she's it was really a pleasure meeting her. She's she comes from a different background, and she was there with uh, Laura Anderson, Laura FM, and Vanessa mm -hmm. from Degraded Daughters. They're friends. It was yeah. really a nice night. We really had a great time. It was good meeting you, Jen. Yeah. Okay. Next one, Selena Camoer, Kem Mitch. I always find it interesting to see how tall. Uh, you YouTubers are, since it's so hard to tell online. Our lawyer friend Zach is a beast of a giant, and Alex is a little muffin. Uh, how tall are you? Uh, I, well, you know, I, I was six foot, and I still say six foot on my driver's license, but I'm shrank. <laughs> I mean, at my age, you know, once you hit 26, like me, you know, you start to shrink a little bit. So, so I, I'm I, six I, foot. I'm yeah, six one. I'm six one, and I still am. <laughs> yeah, well, you're lucky. So uh, maybe I'm still six foot. I don't know, but I can't imagine. Um, well, that must have been quite a sight when when Miscavige got a hold of you in the garage, five one and, and six. Yeah, but see, uh, the thing I weighed probably a hundred pounds less. I was literally, uh, you know, I was a very skinny guy. You know what I mean? And yeah, but I wasn't going to fight back anyway. You know what I mean? Uh, there was yeah, no of course not. There. No, there's no point. Yeah. There's no point. No, there's no point. It, it's I, I, you know, it's funny because I've been around it for so long. You know, I, I knew how to react. You know what I mean? I wanted people to see Miscavige is crazy. And he had a whole entourage like he always did. You know, he had an entourage with him. Right. And so I knew if I fought back, they would just kind of grab me and pound me. You know? Yeah, so and he had, he had just, some big guys. Marty was a big yeah. guy. Greg was a big uh, guy. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The dog got is that your dog? Him. Yeah, one second. I'll let him out. All right. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Thanks, Selena. How tall are you, Janice? <laughs> I am 5'5". Five five. Well, there you go. Were you taller or shorter than David Miscavige? Taller. Taller than David Miscavige. So there you yeah. go. There's confirmation that David Miscavige is shorter than 5'5", five five because he was shorter than Janice, who's 5'5". Five five. 
Well, yeah, I was so probably five, I was probably five six at the time. Yeah. So, but I was still taller than him. Yeah. Yeah. Selena wants to know who is responsible for the we stand tall video. I have to I have to chime in here because I have to make sure nobody thinks I was responsible. Uh, because I was is, in I was in there. Yeah, you were. In fact, I'm going to do a short. I, I, I'm figuring out how to do these shorts that you do, Mitch, which you do so well. I was going to do a freeze frame to show I'm right behind Mark Yeager and Ray Midoff. And you can see me clearly. Um, a pan, they pan across and pan back. I'm yeah. Both times. Who, who directed that? That was done before I got there. Um, was that probably Joe, Joe. It was Joe Canine. Yeah. And yeah. we literally all just came in there and uh, they had the lyrics up and we basically just had to sing. It was, it was, it didn't take very long to do. No, I mean, really that's simple. that you guys, I think you did that in the music studio, right? Didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, thankfully, the music, yeah. The music studio. Thankfully I was in trouble. So I was in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Selena says we're all taller than DM. Actually, most fire hydrants are taller than DM. <laughs> so most bar stools, okay. I mean, he's a perfect height for a bar stool, like. <laughs> but anyway, or a tripod. Um, yeah, I refer to the we stand tall as the bad sweater video. Yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah, we all had. They said they told yeah. us put on a sweater. You know what I mean? So in the, yeah, the yeah, late eighties, late eighties, and it was like you know, you know, uh, terrible. Anyway, yeah, there's a, a kind of a funny story. I I, I had not been con well, I I hadn't been contacted by Gold yet, but they knew who I was. I I was doing work in L.A. marketing work, and I I shot a like an infomercial for the a Dianetics thing they were selling, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted footage from that video to put in. We stand tall, right? They wanted footage I yeah. shot, a, yeah. a recreation of a Dianetic seminar. And I was on my way to, uh, on vacation, I was driving out of state. I was like in Southern Utah. And uh, we had answering machines back then. And my answering machine started blowing up. Those guys filled a 90 minute answering machine tape with calls. Hello, Mitch, hello, it's cold. You gotta call us, you gotta call us. We need to call us, we need to call us. I well, I like this is insane. And then well, they, finally, they were un, under death. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea. I, well, just from that red flag of no, alone that these people were capable of filling up ninety minutes of, a, of, of an answering machine uh, yeah. tape out of, and calling every fifteen minutes. Like uh, anyway, I got back in time. I sent them the video and they put it in. But I was like, holy moly, man! Don't ever call me again. But then you know, I got uh, I got seduced by CMO Gold and then. Uh, David Miscavige. To, I do mean, you, I mean, let me. I just well, thought of something. Okay, you know, you know that when they started doing events, you know, and and uh, they didn't shoot them live. They videotaped. You know, they taped them and then edited them, right? Right. Um, and then when they started showing videos like that, we stand tall. But yeah. Also presentation videos, right? They, I mean, literally, yeah. they didn't start that until the Portland Crusade and make you know, because they have very rudimentary video editing stuff, right? right? But right. anyway, DM borrowed, a t I had a tape, I had a videotape of NBA highlights, okay? And it was quick cut, like an MTV type thing, do right. you know what I mean? Yeah, right. He used that to show the editors as to how he wanted videos done. He took my tape yeah. that I had and used that. It's just funny, I just remember. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, not su I'm not surprised. He was a big... Uh, <laughs> Gave him a scavenge. Oh, Mark, Mark Headley put that up. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. This one here. Yeah. David, Davey Miscavige was wearing an Arame sweater for that shoot. His sweater yeah. cost more than a year's pay for a Sierra member. That's yeah. correct. So, <laughs> someday we'll have to talk about, and, and Mark knows all about this, about the gifting culture at gold, Ugh. about, about the, the gift lists that come out of Miscavige. Like, you know, like I would get these calls, my, like, assistant would just start hammering on me you know that cub's office needs your wish list for your birthday or your um you know christmas and then i put things on that i'd always be embarrassed because i'd get it back and they say no they want more they want something like meaning something more expensive one year i got so pissed off that i put on there a ten thousand dollar air maze men's briefcase <laughs> that i wanted for christmas just to get them to show up. They didn't get it for me, but they, you know, it was something pretty outrageous. But there was the politics of this, this gift, these wish lists. I'm sure you experienced that, Mark. Well, I was going to say, you know, we, Janice and I both, when L. Ron Hubbard was alive, there was a uh, L. Ron Hubbard 
public relations officer at Gold right. named Janine Boyd. Janine Boyd. At every Christmas and every birthday, because we were in the CMO, Commoners Messenger Org, we got birthday gifts and Christmas gifts from L. Ron Hubbard. And right. Janine was the one who would go out and buy them. And we had to do wish lists. But right. Janice, like you got, you girls got jewelry. I remember my ex-wife yeah, had jewelry, all... fur coats. I mean, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, right? it was just... I got, I got yeah. skis and boots. I got a whole my whole I got a, I got a three-piece suit one time, a, th a, ta a three-piece suit for my birthday once. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were going. I thought you were going to mention the collection for birthdays from the staff well, no, because that, Mark Headley's talked about that. Because no, we never did that. We never did that. We we would do a Delaware birthday gift when I was in Clearwater, right? But they didn't collect for like scavenge or anybody. I mean, we Janice, I don't ever remember paying for crap like that. Do you? Oh no, it was. Right. I, I would always get a list uh, from Dave's office with like seven hundred dollars shirts and things that I was expected wow. to buy for him. Wow, no. Yeah, but here, I this is a, a, a $3,000 uh, high-def audio player and a $1,500 set of earbuds. Thank you, Dave, very much. It's just the love bombing is all it is. It's just occasionally I, um, you just get love bombed with a bunch of swag. It's funny that you mentioned that, though. You know, I um, I literally have – I got a Nakamichi uh, clock radio, stereo clock radio. I still use it today to stay. I have it next to my bed. I yeah, got it as a gift. I got it as a gift from L. Ron Hubbard for my yeah. birthday, probably 35, 40 years ago. Yeah, That's I amazing. Bet you, I, I bet you if it. you looked up what it's worth on eBay, you'd be shocked. Really? It, yeah, I mean, Nakamichi <laughs> was amazing. Oh, so, that yeah, was I, it. That was the thing, man. Oh yeah. They, they were they were big on Nakamichi. That was actually all of oh, the yeah. uh, all of the players and all of the or, orgs. The, the yeah, all the cassette yeah. decks were Nakamichi, Nakamichi, yeah. And then we had Studer, Studer uh, you know, tape machines and yeah. I, yeah, I I learned all that stuff when I worked there. It was great. Oh yeah. Hey, I think we're at the end of our questions uh, everybody. It's uh, we've been going for a while here. Um Anyway, Mitch, we really appreciate you coming on wow. and doing this with us. I love talking to you guys. It, it was <laughs> fun. Everybody says the same thing when we all sort of meet, that it's like, okay, we did this one, and now I have 10 more that I need to do with you guys because it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the, well, the person- Well, it's fun that, catching up, yeah. It is, but Headley needs to, he needs to come to the plate and like get on with- you know, I love seeing him and Claire together and him and Mike. Yeah. And what, well, he, he's busy. I mean, I would love to yeah, have him on, too. But, but we were lucky. I would feel very blessed that he was there in the chat today to asking. And yeah, no, comments, I was, you know? too. Thank you, Mark. Because he's hard to get a hold of. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah thank you, yeah. Mark, if you're still he there. Keep, he's threatened. Uh, Claire, let me know. He's threatened <laughs> to go on and do a uh, – he, he and I would do a making of a bunch of gold films. So that would be yeah. – that would be a lot be of fun. Riot. Yeah, it would be funny. Well, just just the comments today, we were remembering films and the funny yeah. stories just <laughs> pop out, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. Okay, guys. Listen, everybody, I was going to say, subscribe to Mitch's channel uh, at, at Scientology-the-big-lie is the uh, the address for his channel on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, and when you go there, when you go there, check the community page because I have a, a buy me a coffee. And then I also have an Indiegogo campaign going on to raise the money to complete my book because I, I have some costs that Fabulous. I've heard of, and okay. I'm not able to do it all myself. That's great. Uh, he, we, he can use the support. Uh, please subscribe to our channel at Mark Fisher and Janice Gillum Grady. Okay. Also, if you'd like to become a member of our channel, just click on that join button. Uh, we we do one on ones with our peeling masters. You get a free autographed uh, copy of Janice's book if you're a peeling master. And uh, we've got quite a few members to our, our channel. We really appreciate that. And then, as I mentioned before, we've got our merchandise uh, up there now. So if you hit the store, you can buy a Rock Slammer t shirt or <laughs> get an autographed copy of Janice's book, uh, you know, and we send it right out to you. And then, uh, so anyway, we appreciate that if you click on the store. Uh, is there anything else, Janice or Mitch, that you want to say before we end off? No, except thanks. Thanks for being such an incredible community and being so welcoming and uh, being willing to, to actually listen to all of my gas bagging about, <laughs> you know, it's just, look, I, I guess there is one thing that I kind of meant to say yeah. is that, you know, our past is, our present includes our past. and But Scientology, they, they only want you to be able to deal with that when you're in a quote-unquote auditing session. When you're out of the auditing session, the past doesn't matter. But it really is an important part of your existence. It's one of the reasons why I started to speak out so I could really begin to reclaim the things about my past that were actually important. 
which is one of the reasons why it's good to tell these stories and to connect. So thank you all very much. Well said, Mitch. We really yeah. appreciate it. Okay, everybody. Until the next time. This. Thanks. Yeah, me too. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care. Bye.